I want to get the meeting going. Um, I do note that all members of the Finance Committee are present, and we also have our manager, Tom Hall, with us today. And um, the item number three, um, the minutes are not available at this time, so we'll probably have two sets of minutes for the next meeting to go over. Mm -hmm. And I did want to offer an opportunity. We do have a couple of people in the audience if you'd like to speak. If you can just uh, go up to the podium if you want to say something, you're welcome to do so. Thank you. My name is Ted Ellis. I live on 4 Thurston Lane. It's early in what people would call a budget process that's going to be going forward, or which you have a significant responsibility for. It's times of great trepidation in state and local governments, and I have great empathy for what you're going to be going through. I have a little experience in budgets, and I only ask you to stay with the course. Uh, I know you'll be reasonable. This is a great community, and it has a good, solid base. And it's sad the political posturing that's going on in this state with the pressure on the cities and towns the way it is. Um, I won't speak to specific things that I've been reading in the paper, other than I see this a general tone from some about, I'll call it slash and burn, and I don't think that's a Scarborough process. I encourage you. I think you have a great manager and finance director, and what you get is really good information. Uh, some people are posturing that we have too much debt and debt is going up, but they forgot that the general public in this community voted for that project that brought it on. Uh, and it's a part of evolution in government. If you want to have good infrastructure and take care of your capital needs, you need to do that. Uh, I'm not a believer in chasing small amounts of dollars. It's a big project view facing you. It's looking at the big picture and thinking two and three year increments. Sometimes you can get caught up in thinking of just this year, we're going to cut the tax rate and take two mills down. What that puts you in position for the next year is you've got to face two mills down from the prior year plus new things coming at you. So I only encourage you to use good decision making, which I think you will, and I'll probably be back in the future when I see some numbers that I can really speak to. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and I did want to note for the record that our finance director, Ruth Porter, has joined us, so welcome, Ruth. Uh, next uh, is uh, year-to-date financials. Um, so before we get into that, it was intended that uh, only to be a distribution factor because it is only the second month after the mid-year. Um, However, my scheduling, um, I made a mistake, so our primary conversation today was going to be on county government, but my, um, my calendar got mixed up, so I apologize to the, my co-members here because uh, we weren't able to bring them in because they had other obligations, so we're going to be doing that at the next meeting. So um, I know that, Councillor Hayes, I think you had a couple of questions that you wanted to ask about the financials, just to refresh. Yeah, Ruth, I think you probably told us last time, but I think I'm having more senior moments as time goes on. <clears throat> but on, ta on page three, which you're talking about other town fund expenditures and other school fund expenditures, there's just some, some variances there. Can you just help refresh our memory and what, what those are? In terms of like the percentage used or? I'm just, I'm just looking at the budget versus where we are for expenditures and just trying to understand what that was for and why there's a difference. I'm sure you told us last time, but I just have kind of. There are uh, some budgets that, some funds, excuse me, that have budgets and some funds that don't have budgets. Now, in each of these, at least on the town's side, we have special revenues and two capital project funds. Portions of that have uh, budgets. The Fund 1200 special revenue is all related to the police department. It's called the COP FAST grant. And uh, so that's a grant, so we pick that grant in the special revenues. And that portion of those officers' expenditures, salary and benefits, are charged to the special revenue fund. But in addition to that are all the other special revenue funds that don't have budgets. For example, um, our rescue reserve monies could go here. Our any additional monies above revenues for uh, the beach revenues goes in here. So some of those revenues 
show up here, we also have um, other different grants that go in here that don't have budgets. So, you know, we get a $5,000 grant for like uh, vests or something like that. They go in here, there's no budget for them because it's hit or miss whether the departments will actually collect, the, you know, receive the grant money. So in some respects, that's why these, excuse me, expenditures and revenues may seem higher than normal. I'm trying to think on the expenditure side for special revenues, what might be in that, which I'm not really thinking right now, but I can check on that and, and yeah, I mean, I think, I think that I was looking at it. <clears throat> so if you just look at other town fund expenditures, the revised budget was, uh, well, the original appropriation was 2.4, say, and we've spent 4. Point, no, or almost 5. So I'm just wondering. On the other uh, two funds, the Fund 1300 and Fund 1310, those are both capital project funds. And while we appropriate money each year for our capital projects, which are usually major projects, yeah. Uh, we don't always finish the project in the year it was budgeted. And so the budget that's showing in the revised budget might have some encumbrances from the prior year. The original budget will be what is approved by the council. The revised budget will include purchase orders that were encumbered at year end that have not been um, finished. We haven't, we, we've dedicated the money, but mm -hmm. we haven't spent them yet. And that's what that difference is. And then on the year-to-date expenditures, not only does that include expenditures from this year's budget, for example, it includes expenditures from budgets from the prior year that we might not have finished. Um, Trigen project that we're working on right now is an example of that. I believe the budget was in 2014, but we're actually spending most of that money, or will be spending most of that money this year. So those are the types of things that might cause the budget and the expenditures to differ a little. I think it's fair to say this is kind of the oddball. Uh, all the stuff that doesn't fit nicely into a fiscal year where you can see the budget and, and look at expenditures and they track very carefully very mm. closely mm. or we can explain the anomaly. <coughs> this is where all that kind of oddball stuff is from prior years and unexpected grant revenue with projects provide more detail on any one or all of these, that would be helpful so you know the activity. Just from, from a, is there a way, so if, so if I'm tracking you, these are these may be monies that were in a budget a prior year and we didn't spend them. Correct. Yeah, is that somewhere on the balance sheet then so that you can compare these expenditures that are occurring in the current period that really, I mean, how do, how do we know whether this is, we should be concerned or not concerned about what we see here? Um, what we can do is, uh, this is just one, you know, number. Yeah. We have the detail that shows, <coughs> in more detail, I guess, uh, for example, in the Fund 1300, it'll show Project A, here's your budget, and then it might have Project B with no budget because the budget was in the prior year, but we have expenditures. Um, so I can provide that detail, and you can see which ones are budgeted in the current year because there'll, there'll be a budget number there, and then you'll see the ones that don't have budgets which 99.9% um, .9 of the time is because it's from a prior year budget. If we do have a few instances as um, towards the end of the year, May, June, where the budget's been approved, the department has started a process for the next year budget and they, somebody may require a down payment or something, you know, in order to do that. So that might hit the current year budget even though it's technically not budgeted till next year. But if you want that detail, we can, I can provide that to you. I know we, in the last year, we, we didn't really focus on this, so this is new for me just as it's new for yeah. Peter yeah, and John. Yeah, let's provide the further questions are made to satisfy your, your inquiry. Mm -hmm. it, and one of the questions I'd have is, because it sounds from the town manager's explanation that it's a bit of a hodgepodge of things thrown together, uh, is there... Do, do the auditors look at this? Is uh, is there some sort of making sure that it's being properly handled? I do review um, all of our accounts, uh, and then um, in addition to that, I prepare for my own internal financials. Um, but I only do it once a year because it's a pretty expensive project. Is I list by fiscal year those items 
that were budgeted in that fiscal year, and then I track them every future year that they're still open. So as to provide work papers as a reconciliation of where you're going with each of these? Correct. And yeah. if the project's on task, and then, you know, towards year end, and when I'm getting ready, okay. we're getting ready to bond, I'll ask the department, tell me, is this project closed? Because then we'll make it go, you know, we'll, we'll close the project out, and it, it goes either to the general fund or wherever it needs to go. If there's a balance, if there's an overage for whatever reason, you know, DEP kicks in, and um, then we talk to the departments, the town manager, and we come up with, uh, you know, where do we want to put this over expenditure? And most of the time, they're they're not that extensive. So, so with that in mind, if, um, and not looking at the line item, I'm looking at just the last two lines, which is the total revenues and total expenditures. How does 72 percent um, of total expenditures being expended and 80? 3% of revenues, how does that, I mean, is that on pace? It's, to me, that's the number I'm really looking at uh, because it combines everything together and balances it out, right? Is that good? Is that bad? Well, at, um, after... It seems to me it is because your expenditures are slower than your revenue collections, which is always better, right? Correct. <laughs> you never want it to be reversed. <laughs> and after seven months, we should be at 58%, you know, wherever... Theoretically, 58% spent, 58% collected, and um, as we know with our debt service, we pay all our principal and one interest payment way up front, so that budget looks skewed all the time. County tax is another one that always County, looks 100% right. spent yeah. after, you know, October. And um, so... Library is usually ahead, too. And library is usually ahead. Community yeah. services tends to skew things a little because their revenues come in in, you know, chunks. And, but their expenditures are pretty consistent. So in, in I think these two percentages are, are, are on track. The revenue piece also gets a little skewed because we show all of our property tax yep. revenues up front as a revenue, and then we book a receivable. And so the receivable okay. is out there. And that's why on the very first page, I say how much is actually collected in property tax revenues, which as of January was 51% which is a little bit more than half, which is where we probably should be right now. I mean, at the end of this month, and again, at the end of March, you'll see that number rise dramatically. Yeah, second half bills has gone out, and that money's starting to come in, to <coughs> flood in between now and the end of March. Any other, um, no. Tom, Tom, did you have any overview? Because we had talked about um, on these interim periods, instead of getting into the line item detail, is really, Maybe getting an executive memo from you that says, here are my watch items, such as, um, obviously, a um, snow budget might be a little bit challenged right now, so, um, and things like that in, a, in more of a memo format to be attached to this. Um, I certainly could do that, and, and uh, there's nothing really noteworthy other than the winter maintenance related items, and I can provide some further detail. This uh, high level review, it really gets buried, it's, a, it's yeah. almost undetectable uh, at this level. Um, but I assure you we're well aware of it, and the charge given to the department heads is they need to manage the budget. So if they are overexpended in certain lines, they need to compensate it uh, in other lines. So their standard is to stay within budget, bottom line budget. Um, and, and I'm supremely confident Mike will be able to do that. Um, it's not insurmountable. Um, Would you be able to do that next month, being a quarter end? Or actually, no, sorry, April? At the end of March, do it for the April meeting. Yeah, for the April meeting, you just have a watch items. Yeah. yeah, watch items, but even positive trends as well. So it's not just negative stuff, but things that are trending yeah. better than normal. And Tom, Tom and I did talk about, you know, providing a high-level overview and, and watch items, yeah. if you will. And you know, after we reviewed a lot of these budgets, except for the, you know, the outliers that we talked about just now, everybody's pretty much on track. So it's. It, I guess there was really nothing to report. Really, no so major no watch major item change. to yeah. identify at the present time. Good. But that might change as we get closer to the end of the year. Too, yeah, so. absolutely. Any other items under the financials? So this actually um, actually leads into the next conversation, which is um, moving towards a trend analysis type of approach of review of financials and the state of our, our community. So um, as an example, the item that we just looked at, which was the total expenditures and total revenues, in a dashboard approach, what I've done in corporate life is that um, you take those two measures and you put what is your benchmark, and then you have an indicator that says it's either positive, negative, or it's neutral. 
And so I'm thinking, and when I'm thinking of trends analysis, and by the way, I think that the this, what you provided us, is great, is really good. We have in front of us, uh, really, it's a, it's a small package of about five different four measures. I think it's four. Um, I mean, I have a couple of recommendations. Um, this is our first. But this is, this is wonderful because it's more of a year-to-year -year look at what is going on financially within the community. And a lot of these, it looks like, goes back to at least 2005, um, which is a nice benchmark because it's before the recessionary period that we experienced. So to me, that is a, a nice timeline. But some of these, um, you know, as a, like the property tax collections, if that is a, what is the percentage at each of those points? Mm -hmm. So is that 95 percent, 98? What are the on a percentage basis? I like the whole dollars. Uh, personally, if you wanted to narrow that down, you could. I'm I'm into rounding. <laughs> Makes it easier. <laughs> two digits, you know, maybe or two digits and one decimal. Um, in most of those areas, actually, um, some type of except for maybe the third graph, and it might be too much to have a percentage in there because it's too much data. Which one's that one? I. Um, not it's ordered. the general fund expenditures by function. And on this, if I could recommend, um, if the other, my co-counsel agrees, I would actually prefer to see, um, I think of the name of it, it would be just a, a linear graph and not a bar graph. Like, so, like this one, sort of? Yes, and each, basically each, each line is one of the functions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That way it's easier because um, I have uh, some site problems, a little dyslexic, and so all those colors together get really blurred. And mm -hmm. one of the things on, on this, specific one is I did exclude the school because otherwise all of the other budgets would be down here and you don't oh, yeah. see anything <laughs> right. and then the schools yeah. would be up there. So right. I was hoping to and in the future we can probably provide one with the school, uh, uh, just the school's budget sure. based on their, you know, how they like their information yep. reported. And then I like the last one as well. I don't know if there's anything. Just, so what, what I was suggesting is that um, in addition to this is that if you had a table that had, you know, maybe it's by department, like you have on this one. Is it public? Yeah. And that table three is to show in, I'm just trying to think, in the current year um, for just a, a, where are you from month to month? So when you do an overview, this is great from year to year. I'm just saying is that, um, um, and I can give you a couple of examples. I know because I sit on EcoMain. Uh, finance as well, and uh, so they have kind of a dashboard thing that they use, like light sign oh, indicators, yeah. triangles, or stuff. I can't remember exactly what they use for their indicators, but it shows like if, uh, if it's a green, you know, if it's a green triangle pointing up, it's good. If it's a green triangle pointing down, it could be good too. You know, it's all different ways right. of doing it. Um, but this is a great, this is a great start. Yeah, I was wondering whether uh, uh, one of the things about bonds. Uh, the questions that people have is what does the future hold? You know, at what period of uh, pace are we paying them off? Because if you didn't add any uh, uh, bonds to what we already have, over time this would go down to zero. So uh, I'm wondering whether or not that would assist us to understand. The, the, the burden that exists over the next five years, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, assuming we don't incur any more debt, that's not a fair assumption, I suspect. But right, yeah, we exactly. have amortization schedules that uh, we, we can tell you over the next 20 years what our debt service requirements are. All the way to the final, if we bonded nothing else forever. Right, because this is down. the principal outstanding. Right. Uh, so uh, you'd be able, based on the amortization schedules, so we could bring you it know out. what equity is going to be paid off. This one might just be principal. Okay. Yeah, sure. What was 2011? Yeah, I was going to ask. Just the two, the two big bumps. What was it in Wentworth, was it? Is that when it gets started? Big bump between 2011 yeah, and 2012. Yeah, we're at 68. Or was uh, that the high school? No, because I was, was that the high school? I we, think the high school was before. No, that was before my time before. So that would be Wentworth, and we, we, uh, we actually had two different series of bond issues. In 12 and 13, we did, that was the Wentworth. Both yeah. of those were Wentworth. Oh, that was the right, total. Right, it went from 66 to 82 million. It, it and then jumped again to, and then jumped to, again to 96. That's about the 30. 30 about the 30. Five and a half. Is and what actually, is what part of that 82 was um, built within that year's bond issue, I believe, was a major refunding of three prior year, uh, 2003, 4, and 5. We refunded all three of those over a period of a couple of years, and that's 
I think is built into some of those numbers also. Mm -hmm. Saved significant in interest, uh, but, w but we did do a, a major advance for funding as part of that. Oh, okay. Uh, what we're borrowing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Accelerated those payments. Yeah, so I should mention on the issue of debt, uh, it's going to come front and center. We are embarking on a long-range facility planning effort, and so part of that is obviously to work with staff and, and other interested parties, even the public, understanding what uh, capital needs are going forward so we can start to get, and get the master list. And ideally, um, as part of that also will be to dovetail other interests, whether it's library, which is a bit separate and removed from a school, has its own set of capital initiatives that they're working on. Ideally, we have dovetail it together so we can see a master list of all the projects. Right. The final piece of the analysis is to be sensible or sensitive to debt service appetite. And so we'll be looking at these amortization schedules and we can, I know already where we'll be shedding debt such that we would be in a position arguably to take on additional without um, Affecting the tax you know, keeping the debt service level. And I think you know that's one of the things that we can show you that we've stayed, I thought I saw it here, maybe not. Uh, our, our goal recently has been to, s to keep our debt service obligations stable so we don't have variability um, in the tax rate. And you'll see that year to year. So what I was going to recommend or, or mention is that a great comparison, this by itself is nice to know, but what makes it better is that in that same chart, you have that debt. Um, the actual Annualized the annualized, annualized debt service or the reduction, it would be the kind of the invert of this curve, yeah. right? Because then it shows how much you're actually drawing, you know, basically paying off every year. And yes. then I think we talked about this would be, we were talking about using different benchmarks. Right. But this would be helpful, at least for me to understand where our debt is as a benchmark compared to other municipalities. Okay. And that's right. that would be really helpful to say. For a select few. Yeah, to say, are we in the ballpark, or is it, you know, where are we vis-a-vis -vis other surrounding communities? It would be very helpful to know. Or best practice, what they suggest. Because I think we talked about some benchmarks of what they said municipalities should have in debt versus, so I'd just be curious. Those, those benchmarks would be really helpful, I think, There's as we have those conversations. There's a requirement that most of us go by in terms <clears throat> of how much um, a school can borrow, what we can borrow for the school. We can't do more than, I think, it's 15% of uh, the town's yeah. would, assessed value. You'd be shocked if what the statutory Huge. limit is. It's uh, high. $550 million. $550 million so in debt service, or, or debt obligation. Um, we're at about 2.6% uh, or so, something right now. We're really low, but in terms of, you know, you look at this number, it's huge, and it's huge. But when you look at how much we could borrow, hopefully we never would ever get near that amount. It, it's even the other point that Mr. Ellis is making, I, I believe, is, uh, he and I have talked about this, um, and I think what you'll see, we'll show you the benchmark, and it shows us out of whack. But frankly, we, which way? deferring maintenance, um, you know, many of the surrounding towns haven't taken care of the infrastructure we have, like we have, um, particularly on the school side. Now South Portland's made a, re a a fairly recent major investment in their high school. Biddeford's done the same, so they're catching up. And we, frankly, I think it's been wise to borrow at times at historic low interest mm -hmm. rates. So there will be some equalization over time. Uh, right now, I think we do lead the pack, and it looks out of whack. But they'll be catching up because these these problems don't go away; they just get more expensive. Is that? Uh, do you have that in terms of debt service as opposed to total amount of bonds? Uh, in fact, I think we have it in debt service, annualized payments. Because obviously, if you were able to borrow uh, astutely at the right moment, uh, then you could be uh, beating your peer group simply because they didn't take advantage of the marketplace. Uh, I also am wondering if uh, the rapid growth over the last 20 years of Scarborough, which is not matched by probably several of, or many of the peer <coughs> municipalities would cause, I mean, when you double in size or triple in size, you have to take account of school needs that other communities wouldn't have to take into account. And those, I'm assuming, are driving, certainly when you see Wentworth School here, sort of driving the bus. And even during uh, the recession where other communities lost value within their communities, 
Scarborough didn't lose value. They gained, albeit small, smaller chunks yeah. than in the past. We continued to gain, so mm -hmm. the town of Scarborough continued to grow where other communities lost. The, the other factor that affects our debt load is that we unfortunately don't rate very well for school funding from the state, and so many <coughs> of our projects have been fully funded at the local level, right. whereas many other communities um, have been able to enjoy significant, if not 100% right. state funding. You mean all, all have been funded locally? Uh, I, don't, I don't think we've had any middle, funded middle by the school, state I think had for 10, 15 years. Middle school had, had significant really? funding. Um, an original high school one they did, I don't remember when, but earlier than the most recent one was yeah. had a little bit of funding. $28 for the high school rehab in Recently. the early 2000s. It was all ours. Thirty-five and a half at Wentworth is all on the local <coughs> time. Yeah. <coughs> I think the middle school was the last one. That had some funding. That had right. funding from the state, and that was in pre, that would have been 2000. <coughs> pre my tenure on the council, and I got here in the late 90s. Late 90s. So um, I wanted to. So on the outstanding bonds, I think um, having the debt service piece on that. One thing that um, Councilor Hayes mentioned, I think would be a great chart is uh, um, it's a benchmark chart. So if it shows what our debt, um, what our debt is in comparison to what the maximum that is allowable. So on one line you'd have what your the state allowance is uh, based, and guaranteed that would change because it can only be. X percentage of total capital, total assessed value, okay. and then have the comparison to the other communities. You know, to pick three or four communities, I wouldn't want to see 15 communities right. on a chart. That'd be a little too much to. Yep. And we also have policy that gives guidance. Um, so the other, the other debt management as well. Yeah. Uh, town policy. Town yeah. policy. Yeah. This that prior finance committee about three years ago put in place that establishes our own. Guidance for management of debt and establishes our own limits, if you will. Or that would be a good piece in there. What's the state limits? What's the town council's limits? Right. And where, where are we performing yeah. in comparison to that? The other one um, I was hoping, because I know that we have a policy on, is also, and, and by the way, it's, it's a good comment around the debt piece because there is one agency when they do rate us, uses purely, purely focuses on, on debt, while the other one focuses solely on reserve. So I was, I was hoping that we could also get a reserve chart in here. Um, fund balance. Yeah, fund balance. Yeah, that was that was our goal, but we ran out. No, of no, absolutely. <coughs> no, no. We knew that I knew that this was going to be a working process, so this is great. And if you could supply us, you mentioned Eco Maine or other um, formats that you think are particularly helpful. Sure. We'd be very interested in seeing that. Where did I see? You did have some information on fund balance. Oh, maybe on the uh, balance sheet? Yeah. Oh, the, the, the finance? Oh, I think it's on the, yeah, it's on the balance sheet that was first page of financial. Okay. But I think what Sean's looking at is looking at over time. Oh, there it is, yes. Oh, here it is. How fund balance has been affected. Yeah, it's the same year to year type of comparison as the, uh, the other graph that was provided. Yeah, the other thing that kind of this, this, this display affords you is to, is to obviously look at trends. Right. Yeah, I like that. Do that. Um, I just want to make two points. One, one of them was on the excise. I thought it was just graphically very telling to see just how volatile that revenue yeah. stream has been to us. And it just further confirms that yeah. excise tax is directly related to economic yeah. um, well -being. activity and comfort and consumer spending, I guess yeah. is a better way to put it. So we really did dip low there in the in the depths of the uh, recession and have rebounded and frankly exceeded where we were before. And I think excise is our second after property taxes. Actually, it's probably, well, actually, it might be our second now. Um, educational subsidy used to be second, but I think that's dropped. So, you know, excise tax is our second largest revenue source, and that, to me, is where it becomes really imperative that we essentially fight to keep those revenues instead of asking the state mm -hmm. to take it. Okay. Just, just a good question, the, the, the dramatic sort of increase, did the rates go up or is that just a matter of people actually had older cars that they have now yeah, swapped? I, this, to me, I, I think this story tells uh, people hung on their old cars and all of a sudden Things got better, and they're all buying yeah. new cars. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we'll see that plateau pretty quickly. We're not going to see a precipitous climb. Uh, I think this is pretty good economic indicator. Yeah, I think it is. There was uh, 
uh, one year where the federal government gave some uh, the cash for clunkers. Something like that, where you uh, get yeah. a discount or a tax yeah, yeah. break, and I think that was a little bump somewhere in I here. I think that's in the 0607 time frame. I was going to say, yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, that goes back a ways. Yeah, huh, interesting. But well, that's a great economic. But I think, runner. Tom, you're right. I think this is gonna, you're going to see a peak here in 14. And it probably actually, start. They might, might actually dip down. If yeah. they made the purchases, they're going to stick with them for three to Absolutely. five years. Right, right. So right. Uh, we've got to be sensitive to that. Yeah. yeah, good point. The other one is on, a, on this sheet. This oh, I like this one. A lot of information. That's great. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, somewhat uh, Mr. Ellison's comments, but I, I think, again, this display that helps uh, many other things jump off this page. I remember it all too well. The council back in 2000. Um, made a very conscious effort to keep the tax rate stable. That was the council's stated goal, and they plugged the holes using fund balance. And so you'll see that we were able to do just that. But um, when we show you the graphic display of fund balance, you're going to see a commensurate or a, con a little conversion dip, dip for in fund because balance. of use. Uh, so it's, it's all related, of course. Um, but this, there's a lot of information on the page uh, that you might find interesting. And, and this, I mean, what I, I mean, if you look across, I mean, just not diving into details, but if you look at the municipal over the five years, I mean, that's pretty reasonable. I mean, you look at that 5.9 percent, very, and then you look at education, and that's clearly a different story. Do we have this would be a really important place for benchmarks too? I would think to see what other commu or other communities experiencing this type of. I, I actually think they are because the other piece that is affected in the education budget is their loss of educational subsidy. Yeah. And so, um, and also with the with the recession, they cut back a lot. If you look at some of these years, they actually well maybe it doesn't show on this one. But um, in the prior years, they were actually losing budget, if you will. And so now they're trying to essentially catch up on some of those. And Scarborough's population and students has generally increased every year, so their, their needs have gone. Yeah, just, uh, if I could point out, if you look at the, the top sheet, which is the gross budget, so if you look at municipal spending 2015, it shows a pretty big increase, 5.17. Um, I can tell you, just because it's fresh in my mind, a big part of the spending was all of the associated costs with the Old Orchard Beach um, contracted services. So we offset, offset by revenue. Uh, uh, then there was a commensurate, in fact, there's almost a 10 percent increase in municipal revenue right. in that year. Yeah, yeah. So ask the question: If you see a number that seems to jump off the page, there's there's usually a backstory, not an explanation, but there's another part to the story. Do you follow me? Yeah. Yeah. But I think this, I mean, having some of those benchmarks would be helpful. And I think, you know, <clears throat> part of the other goal of the council is to do a better job of getting the message out to our community on what we've been doing. And, and you know, th these numbers tell a story that might be a good thing to kind of get out in circulation so people have a better understanding of what the process has been over the last five years and where we are and why we're there and what we intend to do about it. So looking at um, the net budget, municipal and education, um, for me it's not necessarily even a year-to-year -year change that draws attention. It's really the volatility over time. And if you look at them, what causes, I mean, in 2011 the net change was 6.4, it goes down to 2.48, it goes down further, and then there's this huge jump, and then it goes down again. I mean, so I understand why it's down significantly for the you know the 1.2 is because of the new initiative with Old Orchard Beach, but I'm just thinking back over some of those major um, causes like 2011, and even in education. I mean, you go 4.8 to 3. Point, or let's say 4.9 to 3.9 to 10.2. Yeah. So it's it's this you know roller coaster kind of uh, perspective of, of the finances. Because I would think that the the goal is to take both ends of the roller coaster and flatten them out as much as you can, so it's not as steep. Well, I think on the school side, that big 10.2, that was the that was the correction year. So remember, I, I mentioned oh, earlier that we plugged the hole with fund balance, and frankly, they lost about 40 employees uh, over a two-year period uh, in terms of that was just the effect of uh, the, the approved budgets. 
And then there was this huge boomerang effect that third year to restore a lot of those positions. And that was a decision that you know, was supported by the council. So, it was the, so in 2013, it was the restoration I, I, of the correction year. That was okay. that makes throwing sense. back the positions that makes lost. Yeah. And they're still, there's, I mean, they'll still tell you that they are not back 100%. Um, but so okay. with that, yeah. if you do things one year, uh, it may make you feel good that year, but it, it, we've got to have a longer range focus uh, because there are lasting effects sometimes. Right, yeah, that bouncing. But, but this would be helpful to have, you know, some other indexes like CPI, just so if, you, if we knew what, C, what happened to CPI over these same five years, because, I mean, if you go down to the net net, as you're describing, the municipal is about 3% a year, which sounds like it's pretty close to CPI. Um, and, and obviously, some of the others are, are vary from that. So that's just a great benchmark to say, okay, with CPI, if, if it's more than CPI, what are we investing in? Is, is really, or what are some of those cost drivers, which are some of the things we want to talk about? So that's just really helpful. And again, and, and again, the benchmarks of other communities are helpful because presumably they're dealing with similar things. So if the numbers are similar, then it, it feels like we're sort of in the same company. If our numbers are not similar, then that's just a point of reference and a point that we need to understand. <coughs> the real tail, I think, is the middle section. It's the loss of revenues over time. Yeah, that's, that, that ultimately that speaks for itself right across the board except for when you... We don't have control over we we just live with. You know, this is, these are yeah. external forces, and we're a victim of our success in many respects. As Ruth said, we were lucky enough to do, not lose value during the recessionary period where a lot of communities slid backward. And the effect of that, when you plug it through the various funding formulas, whether it's general purpose aid to education or revenue sharing, Heard because us. our value, uh, the rich got richer. Our value by percentage actually further distance uh, from everyone else, and so we were penalized yeah. in those funding formulas. Yeah. So am I correct in looking at the uh, gross revenue, the middle columns, that for education in 2011, the $9 million figure that's shown there is a 20% reduction from 2010? So while 2010 is not shown, <coughs> there is a calculation off of 2010. And it's picked back up in, la in, in recent years. The last couple of years, it's um, you know we're not back. But we're about back to where we were. Mm. Well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over the five-year period, it, it was it was flat. It was two two point eight percent. But I can tell you that fluctuation in 12, 13, 14 was a killer. I mean, that was yeah. a budget breaker. Yeah. Um, yeah. No matter what we did at the local level, we didn't have to fall over that loss of revenue. And the loss of revenue was at the state level. Yes, right. it was. MR, that's when they started really reducing on the MRS. Correct. That's right. In, in a couple of those years, there were mid-year corrections. Yep. We budgeted oh, based on oh, okay. the expectation, and there were curtailment orders that came out. The things had to be done midstream. So if I'm, if I, um, just to refresh my memory, under the governor's proposal, this year we're expecting to actually to keep our MRS. Flat. I, I haven't seen our actual. It's not until next year. He's actually put in about two percent more in aggregate towards mm -hmm. general funding for education, yep. but now it has to be turned through the sausage machine or whatever right. the funding formula. How Scarborough fares out of that, I don't know. I'm hoping that we are held harmless. Mm -hmm. That would be a win. <coughs> so, uh, so as we talk about financial statements, um, are there tools out there that will allow us to do um, a forecast for it? Based on what we know, I know that it may take. We can some extra forecast time. what we can control. I, yeah. I don't know if we can well very much forecast beyond the biennium of the state budget, the two-year outlook, and even that is somewhat variable based on experience. There comes to political things happen. Okay. Things happen. I wanted to ask and, and, and just sort of take a moment on the cost of living thing. Uh, do you equate a level services budget? to a cost of living for the school or the town if we did we don't we we haven't really raised that subject in the context of the town but we have raised mm -hmm. level services budget uh, both last year and again this 
uh, this winter with the school, and we're going to meet with them and talk about that the next time we get together. And I can see at least there's an uh, they're analogous that that last year one of the things they talked about was that the health care cost that they incurred had a substantial increase, and it was out of their control because there was no other provider. And to me, when you do a cost of living analysis, you're going to say, okay, you get a, a basket of goods and services, one of which is the cost of health care services. And so uh, if theirs is going up at a significantly higher rate than what the COLA is nationally, then it's not a it's not an apples to apples comparison. So yeah. that's why I I was I was very interested in getting uh, a a good review with the school people on level service budgeting, because I think that will tell us a lot about what their what they in their world is a cost of living adjustment. Well, that's it. I think. Uh, a CPI is a, is a very understandable, it's, it's the benchmark to look to. I'm not sure if it tracks perfectly well mm -hmm. with us. I mean, you mentioned health care costs. You know, they are 8, 9, 10 percent, um, not, un, not unheard of. In fact, that's probably what we've averaged over the last mm -hmm. five years. Energy expenses, um, similar increases. They don't necessarily track, they don't make sense in right. the context of a 2.1 percent CPI number. And because the school, in particular, 80% or better of their costs are fixed in or, or are labor-related, either wage or benefit. Uh, so it's disproportionate to the way CPI is calculated. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the health care increase alone on the school can have a really extraordinary effect. And to think that they can live within the CPI index is probably not reasonable. So to them, level services is means we keep doing what we did last year. Uh, the reality is that it's likely to cost quite a bit more than the typical CPI number. Yeah. I, I have yet to see anything increase at the same rate as CPI. Yeah. Think about that. Nothing in life changes with CPI at the same exact rate. It's always more. Whether it's health care, whether it's auto insurance, no matter what it is, rent. When rent goes up, for I wonder where the CPI number comes from. Uh, hey, well, yeah, and maybe why is it? I mean, and I'm not saying it's not a it's not a good benchmark, but um, maybe they take uh, gasoline from Houston and <laughs> and and Maine from potatoes. Well, there's dozens so, of yeah. uh, cost of living uh, the indices um, that intend to right. really focus on different sectors. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and I guess my point is, you know, there should be some benchmark exactly. Used. Yes. That's, and that's and reason that's why I wanted to talk about this amongst ourselves, because we are going to talk with the school yeah. board about yeah. it, and I want to have us sort of focus in on what's realistic. You know, and, and I think, and I think there's two things I'd say, because I, you know, I was in an organization that it was very competitive, very low margin. I mean, two yeah. percent margins. Right. And they never accepted level services. I mean, they they always said, you know, because you did it that way last year. You got to find a Doesn't, better, yeah. better way yeah. to deliver the services. There's always something that you're doing that you don't need to do. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to kind of adopt sort yeah. of that that theory that that it's the old 80-20 rule. Probably you get 80% of the value. You know, what I'm trying to say from what you spend, you get 80% of the value from doing certain things. There's 20% of what you do. That probably doesn't happen. So we want a continuous improvement process, and I think that's what we need to think about. How do we put that into the school budget? And we, how do and we, we do that? We and I think if you, if you, you know, I spent some time with with Mike Shaw down at Public Works. Yeah. He has that down with science. I mean, he is always thinking about how do we do this? How do we do it more efficiently? And he's, I mean, if you look at his numbers, he's delivered pretty consistent numbers. Uh, and, you know, so it's pretty impressive. So I yeah. think. But I think some index would just help us then be able to zero in. Okay, we want to talk about, let's talk about what some of the outliers are and why, and then at least gives us a frame of reference. And, and I think we, one of the things that when you talk about drivers, uh, what are the efficiency initiatives that would actually move the needle for the schools? And we talked about that last year a little bit because they weren't sitting there just going, well, same old, same old. They realized that they've got unfunded mandates being imposed upon them 
And so if they just stand still and have blinders on, they're, they're going to be in a, a very difficult situation from a budgetary point of view. So I think that kind of discussion, because I, I agree with that, that you always have to be looking for the efficiencies. But I guess, I guess what, what I think we do need to be aware of, though, is because, and we've certainly heard it, because Scarborough has a high proportion, or we have like one of the oldest senior populations. Their cost of living adjustment, which is based on Social Security, is their reality of yep. what the cost of living is. I mean, we can try to explain other things. You're right. But, but, that's, but, but that's where the rubber hits the road. That's, that's, that's because Social Security does use that 1.7 percent. But, but what I'm trying to say is so, so our communication opportunity is locked in our constituents' mind is if their income is going up 1.7 percent, right. that's the cost of living, and they expect their taxes not to go up any more than 1.7 right. percent. And if it goes up more, then we just need to have a way that we can talk about it, explain it, and get their buy-in. I think it's exactly. We so do need to be able to explain why there might be a difference between what they're experiencing and what the school is experiencing. Right. And to use a uh, CPI index, and we can, we can find one that's most appropriate yeah, and applicable yeah. as a reference or benchmark, I think makes perfect sense. Where I always get a bit uncomfortable, I think past <coughs> finance committees have struggled with this, when the council sets uh, the increase this year shall be no more than X percent. And that, that's set before you even have the conversation yeah, to the appreciate what, okay. right. what um, opportunities, what costs, what <coughs> challenges there are in the budget. Um, so I, I think it's far more productive to use it as that benchmark and reference as we go along as opposed to pluck it out of the sky and try to meet this arbitrary okay. number. And maybe we find a couple of matrices, yeah. uh, metrics, to yeah. be able to compare, not just CPI. Yeah, um, but there, I mean, there are so many different ones. P there's PPI, C I mean, there's all kinds of them, so get a couple of those. We use one, actually, to adjust mm -hmm. the school development impact fees every year, too. And mm -hmm. I can figure out which that one is. Yeah, that. that'd be great. I mean, I think it's given kind of, a, so we can kind of see the range of them, and then we can kind of say, okay, if we're above that range, then let's talk about why, and it may be a very good reason. Right. And we can explain it and say this is why. Well, we'll take this feedback, yep. this input, and, and um, work on these analyses and come back to you. Well. This is great stuff. Yeah, Thank it you. is. It's very good. Thank you. Um, next is about future agenda items, dates, and times. So I did want to mention um, for this meeting, even though the three of us were in the, on the joint session with the town, um, school board finance committee, um, just for the public record, we have set the next um, uh, two joint town council school board uh, finance workshop meetings for March 12th at 1.30 and then March 24th at 1.30 as well. Um, and then uh, we have a lot of work to get going on that to um, approve and to forward to the council. Um, Actually, we're going to be forwarding to the council, I believe, the final the final schedule for the budget development calendar mm -hmm. for consideration. I'm not sure if the if the council as a whole needs to approve that. I'm not sure what you have done in the past. Do you remember uh, approval of our schedule the budget, of the timeline budget? No, I don't think they have. We don't need to send it for approval. I, I do we? we have it in the past. Okay, no. I just want to make sure. So we'll at least forward it as a um, as an informational item yes. to them for that, as well as um, the calendar. Um, what I wanted to mention was I've already reached out to two groups really for um, conversation pieces. One is, as I apologize at the beginning of this meeting, was the county commissioner, uh, Neil Jameson, who's from Scar represents Scarborough, and then also Peter Crichton, the county manager, so that they can give us an overview of their services and their service budget. Um, I made that mistake. I thought that they were both available this week. Um, they won't be available until another meeting. And then I've also reached out to Tom to talk about solid waves. And to bring Mike Shaw in, as well as um, Kevin Roach, who is the CEO of EcoMain, um, as well as any other resources to talk about our solid waste program within the town. That includes everything from, you know, waste hauling out to EcoMain, as well as the pickup on the roadside to maybe some future endeavors. I know that the council has at least um, received information in the past regarding the um, pay per bag. Mm -hmm. It's not a paper bag, but a pay per bag. That's three words. And so there might be some uh, presentation and discussion on that to see if we are going to um, move that forward. Um, 
or to simply sit on that. So it's going to be part of the whole discussion. The question I have for you is um, when would you like to have, because we're ramping up for the budget cycle, do you want to have two meetings in March so that we can fit both of those in before April? Because April is the um, public, it's on the 1st, it's the Joint Town Council School Board Public Meeting. And then the joint, um, the town hall is going to be on the 29th. So I'd like to, I think that we need to get some of this stuff done a in little March. quicker. I'd be quite satisfied meeting twice in March. What, what days uh, work best? The paper bag kind of uh, uh, trash thing, I think, is an important issue that will take a while. In fact, we already have Kevin and others yeah. scheduled for your next finance committee it is, okay. for solid waste. So the extent we can keep that, that would be best. Sure. So right now, the next finance committee meeting, I believe, is on March 18th. That's the scheduled one. The, it's the um, no wait, yeah, it's the third Wednesday of the month, right? Is this out with today, or is it the fourth Wednesday? March 18th. Uh, yeah, I always forget. What did we originally say? It was the third Wednesday because it's in between the two meetings. No, second Wednesday. The second. So the 11th is the next scheduled. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that one will have the county government in. And then, um, what, would you be willing to meet on the 25th? Well, I'm sorry, I already have Kevin Rhodes scheduled for the 11th. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, uh, okay, <coughs> solid waste? Yeah. yeah. And then, okay. we can, on the 25th, if you want to still keep it to the Wednesday kind of pattern, we could ask uh, the county commissioner and yeah. those people to come in as well. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure how long that they will need. Uh, if there's any other topic that we might be able to combine with that to have an hour, an hour and a half so we can get it out of the way. Um, I can tell you, Ruth and I are going to be right down to the wire. Right. I'll be presenting the budget within minus five days at that point. So wow. um, the lighter the better. Uh, okay. Just make that yeah. plea. So maybe okay. counties. I think county will be fine then. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Tom will talk afterwards about getting into I know both uh, Peter and Neil, so yep. we'll schedule that. And both will be at 4 p.m. here in Chambers. And um, the last item that I wanted to bring up um, as chair is that um, I was actually watching, streamlining and watching another community online, and one of their uh, finance chairs actually made a very good presentation to their council, and I was wondering if you um, wouldn't mind, I was thinking about presenting to the full council, um, mostly to get it out there about what we've gone through so far, what has been included in the budget line development, as well as what is the process. Um, it'll also help us outline for the public um, what we are trying to achieve as part of the town hall format um, um, of the uh, presentation of the budgets, um, as well as being able to announce then the date, the time, the place. Um, are you, are you guys okay with me doing that? Yeah, I think I, I would like to. I have already started that, um, so I will uh, forward that to you for a review, if you don't mind, and provide some feedback. Um, and then um, I'll talk with Councilor Holbrook about when it's appropriate for that presentation in March. But really wanted to get out there at least um, how we're formate, you know, formulating the budget and what's the what's the process been, so that they can understand and appreciate the work that we've done. And um, with that, is there any other items from the gentlemen? Could I gentlemen? Just, um, have you look no. at one housekeeping matter sure. for me? So, Sean made mention of the overall budget adoption schedule. Yep. What we haven't talked about is finalizing kind of the review aspect, the, the details of uh, getting through. And so, what I handed you is a proposal, but you'll see it's only focused heavily on the month of April, which is that after I present the budget. Um, this is generally a format we've used in the past. The difference this year, as opposed to a line item review, um, I'm switching up the budget format. And that's the second page I gave you. That's just a template, kind of a representative uh, example of, in this case, it's the Planning and Code Department. So rather than uh, providing you all the level of line item detail, which they'll still produce, because we still need that level of detail for administration, and it exists. Right. But for presentation purposes, we're trying to provide a, a, a more qualitative approach. Um, and so you'll see in this case, um, we're coming up with a simple org chart. The planning department is made up of three divisions. Each of those divisions will 
have a quick commentary about what they do, um, a review of kind of successes and accomplishments from last year, uh, uh, goals and priorities for the for the future year, coming year, and then we'll be reporting uh, cost drivers, activity indicators. Again, the intent of this is to give you and anyone else uh, uh, a much deeper understanding, if you're interested, in what a department does and what are the things you really should be looking at. So my tie it back to the <coughs> schedule I gave you, uh, Sean and I had talked about um, you know, we're, we are shaking things up, and my staff has, has responded well to this form, new format, but it's new and different for us. Um, I think many of them do value an opportunity to be in front of you, and it may be equally of value for you to have them here and to ask a question. But rather than them kind of going, or you walking down line by line, I think it will be much more, much different conversation. It's going to be uh, more macro level, uh, and we can get into as much fine grain as you, as you wish. But I think this format um, in the starting point will allow a much more substantive, qualitative I will, conversation. I will tell you that last year, the booklet we had, which we stayed very close to with department presentations, uh, was it was a very difficult process to absorb the information and ferret out the questions that ought to be asked. So I would be encouraged to try something that maybe is more intuitive in terms of understanding uh, what needs to be understood at the level of analysis that we Well, yeah, do. and this is really intended to do some of that work for you, not to replace your scrutiny and review. It's really flag for you. Um, these are the things that we think you ought to be, uh, that are driving our budgets, or the things that are positive or negative that, that uh, we want you to know about. And then we can expand that conversation in any direction we wish. But uh, now I think there's been some fair, not criticism, but suggestion from the taxpayer group that we need to do everything we can to simplify uh, information for, so folks who can consume it right. and understand right. it. We don't purposely make it complicated, but. Uh, if you give people a string of numbers, it doesn't really tell the full story. No. Uh, so, so is your goal, um, I love this, so is your goal that each of your departments will have one of these? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm just showing you an example is, of code. Um, this is great. I love the format. Um, only one recommendation, Please. and it's really to this summary on the second page. I would really love to see how the goals and priorities match up to the goals and priorities of the town council. So is there a correlation between any one of these that directly correspond to you. So, uh, that yep. way there's direct value to what we're trying to achieve mm -hmm. through your budget allocation. What we'll do is either by font or bolding, we'll somehow... Even in parentheses at the end of the sentence. The star, we'll put yeah. some sort of footnote to say, hey, this is something that aligns. matches, aligns yeah. with the council. Yeah. Good idea. You know, every one of these can say, you know, aligns with council goal number one, you know, yep. one, two, five, ten, and twelve. Or that, I mean, that is great. This is great. It's probably the only other thing on these, on these, I know these are just placeholders yes. for now on the front, but on the total budget or something, is the intent to give some historical perspective too, yep. just like we looked at, that'd be yeah, great so to kind of just see sort of that five year or two year, whatever. This is going to be Bruce uh, short, sure, but uh, this year. Yeah. to yeah. simplify, you know, some departments have a hundred line items, right. and what I'm trying to do is to force every department to eight mm. or ten standard line items, you know, contracted services, wage and benefits. Mm. So collapse all of those lines into more aggregate reporting. Mm -hmm. So there'll be common consistency across. Once we do that for the proposed budget, Ruth is going to reach back to the last two actual great, great. and do that same collapsing. So great. you'll have a year comparison great. and then going forward we'll be able to obviously Yeah, yeah that's great. Good. Well, just to um, I just want to be cautious. I, I've never um, I got to think it through in the sense of how strongly I, um, I um, agree with my comment right now. Um, <laughs> well, no, the reason is that when you compare budget to budget to budget, it's not a reality check. You should be comparing budget to actuals. We are. Right? We but I want to make sure it's to the actual, right. right? Not to a, what we planned on budgeting for last year. Right. Although in municipal governments, that's why I'm not sure if I partially oppose my own comment, because usually the budget is the actual because it's whatever's in the end, right? It, it could vary by a couple. I won't take offense to that comment. Right. We try to. No, actually, I mean, no, you're looking at. 
We'll yeah. be looking at, like, for example, the 2012 actual, uh, the 2013 actual, the 2014 actual, right. okay. and then 15 budget, Perfect. 15 okay. That's great. projected actual. Yeah. Great. This is awesome. It, as good. far as um, putting this information into our hands based on this uh, schedule, uh, it will obviously be exceedingly helpful to us to have it far enough in advance so that we can do our homework. Because if this is what I think it's going to be, yeah. it's going to be loaded with information. Yeah. But it will take a while to fully Best understand. Best I can promise is uh, the budget's going to be hot off the press April 1. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to promise it much earlier. So you'll have it a week in advance. And then what you could do is look ahead to April 8, see which departments are scheduled, spend your quality time looking at those. That's what I'm right. thinking. Yeah. So yeah. We'll, I wanna, I'll program in departments so they know and you know who's coming when. Right. Yep. And to, to make it manageable, you probably do your homework for that session. And when that's done, you look forward. Yeah, Promise exactly. me one thing. What? You're not going to schedule meetings at 4 a.m.? Okay. 4 a.m.? Oh, <laughs> 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 4 a.m. Yeah, 4 a.m. to 5 p.m. That'd be a little rugged. Early, that'd be a little rugged. 13 hours, we can get them all done. Then. Yeah. <laughs> so from a housekeeping, do Wednesday's work in April, it's going to be pretty exhaustive. It's going to be every yeah. week. Um, and there's a 4 a 6 p.m. time frame work. Okay. Although school vacation's in there, right? Yeah, but... I know, I know, I know. My wife's yeah. cabin fever. She's like, oh, really? She um, wants to so, um, <laughs> Do you think that you could have this by the next meeting, the regular town council meeting, so it can be passed out to the re all the members? Okay. I mean, it's we'll talk. It's good enough for their purpose now because it's yeah. locked in dates. Yeah. Um, but I can flush it out. I want to test it with my departments, just with their availability. Yeah. We'll program it out. I'll suggest something, but there's always a little bit of variation. They switch with each other and such. Yes, because at the very um, at the very least, um, if Councilor Hobox agrees with uh, doing a presentation, this would be a good piece as yeah. part of that presentation, as well as a high level outline. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Are you I looking think to do nice. that as soon as next Wednesday? No. Okay. Certainly. I haven't talked to her since. Yep. Yeah. So I'm looking to do it at the second meeting in March. Great. Certainly. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. That's good. Great work, guys. Thank great you. To see. Yeah. Good. Great to see. Any other items, gentlemen? No, none. Great. Right. Um, um, it is 5.05, .05 and I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.